How do costs, incentives affect how we're going to behave? That's what we're going to talk about today. An incentive is a bullet, a key, an often tiny object with the astonishing power to change a situation. Stephen Levitt, he was one of the co-writers of Freakonomics. Today, we're going to talk about how costs and incentives affect the way we behave. This podcast episode is based on a presentation I gave a while ago on how can we get people to work better, work hand in hand better. But this also affects how we can get our goals in our lives. If we understand a little bit about how our brain functions, we can go ahead and start mm, behaving better, thinking about things better, or maybe figure out what things are dragging us down. That's really what we're looking for. And it's weird in a sense because there are psychological activities that go on, of course there are, that we don't even recognize are happening to us. All these tricks, right, of how we're going to try to negotiate and we're going to set this super high price. Oh my gosh, $30,000. And then we'll say, oh, just kidding. It's really only $20,000. Okay. But suddenly you're relieved that it didn't cost what you thought it was going to cost. I mean, there are so many tricks out there. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. The one thing that we have to understand is that costs make us avoid things. We do not want to lose competitive advantage, lose financial advantage. We don't want to lose time. Time, how much time I'm going to have to invest in that. That is what I face at my work all the time. When I travel to customers and try to get them involved in the software go live, they're worried about how much time it's going to take. I know my old system better. I know how to do it. I can be fast with it. You know, I'm that way too. I have my own systems, even at home, even in podcasting. I know them really well. And boy, I can fly. It was one of the huge reasons why when I switched from Windows to Mac, it was hard for me. I could make a Windows machine do exactly what I wanted. I could set it up exactly how I wanted it to be. Mac offered just so many advantages to me I had to take that time cost and just gut it out. Then there's emotional cost, stress, anxiety. Is it going to make us sad or discomforted? What is this new thing going to do to me? That happens in the software world too. You might not know that. But there have been times where I brought software into a hospital situation. They're resistant people, people who just didn't want to do it. And so when I would talk to them about it, you know, oh, this reason and that reason, this other reason. And then you'd find out later, you know what? I've been great at my job for the last 30 years. I'm worried your software is going to make me terrible. This is an emotional problem, not a time problem like I thought it was. Then there's something interesting called opportunity cost. And opportunity cost is basically when you say yes to something, it means you're saying no to other things. For example, if you decide you're going to go on vacation to Iceland, that means you're saying no to the Hawaii vacation no to the Spain vacation, no to the Costa Rica vacation. You can only do one thing at that time. And so opportunity cost means because I picked this, I'm not going to be able to pick something else. So those are just some costs. And all of us go through when we're trying to decide how to not just fix our house or not just what to do on our job. We're worried about these costs and how much they're going to affect us. And there's a lot more costs out there These are all um, in the realm of economics and psychology. So I did the quote from Stephen Levitt because he's the guy who really brought this idea of psychology and the economy going together. And we have to realize that when we're looking at costs, there is no free lunch. Everything has a cost. Maybe whatever is trying to convince you to do one way or another, even me who's coming into your hospital and trying to convince you to use software that you're company already bought, you're judging cost. You're judging all the different costs. But just so you're aware, there is no cost-free item. If you stay in your old system, for the most part, when I work in the hospital, the old system is Excel spreadsheets. My number one target in implementing software is Excel spreadsheets. You say, well, Jill, there's no cost there. It's a part of office with the organization is already buying at an academic price. So Excel alone is free. They know how it works. And so it's basically free. 
But is it because you can't get reports across an entire hospital done? So if I asked you how many clinical trials we have researching breast cancer, you can't tell because then you're going to spreadsheet to spreadsheet to spreadsheet. Now there is a cost. What we have to do when we're evaluating our own situation, but we have to think not only the cost we're aware of, I need a new car. My car, super old, right? And I'm thinking, I need a new car. But the car I have is free and the new car is going to cost money. But is the car free? It doesn't start reliably. It doesn't go the places I want to go. It could potentially be dangerous by abandoning me someplace I don't want to be. And I have to pay to get it fixed all the time because it's very old. Is my free car free? In fact, when I was talking to one of the salesmen at the car shop, he asked me what his number one competition is because I said, I like the car. I enjoy driving in it. And I said, well, your number one competition is a free metal box, which is my old car. That's the thing I'm going to have to overcome in order to buy a car. His goal at that point is to convince me my free metal box is not free anymore. But you know what? When I sit down and I think about it, I know my metal box isn't free. So we're going to have to think honestly when we're making decisions what the real cost is. I had the situation last fall where my roof got destroyed by hail. It was old already. And I was putting off the decision to get a new roof because it still had some years in it. But now the roof got destroyed. What did it cost me? It cost me the fact that now I have some places that rain leaked into my house. I had to go find someone immediately to come and fix my roof, which means can't schedule far in advance. You don't have a lot of choices because there's only going to be so many roofers who can come over right now. And it's even the loss to my sanity. I would sit in bed and I could hear it dripping every time it rained. It was just destroying me piece by piece to know my house is getting damaged every time it rains. There's the cost involved in that particular situation. What do we do now? Now that we know that there are costs involved, how can we deal with personal decisions on these costs? And the first thing to do is be informed about what costs there are. There are so many costs out there. I mentioned some of them earlier on, but there's a lot more out there. Think about not just the direct costs of things. Again, that's the car. How much does a new car cost? The indirect thing, those are all the car repairs I'm going to have to do. Or times where I have to tow my car because I got stuck somewhere up in the North Woods with my car not working. Time costs. How much time is it going to cost me to do a task? Or how much time is it going to cost me when my car is broken in the North Woods to get a tow truck to come up there and tow me back to a place where I can get my car fixed? Stress, disappointment, you know, sort of a negative feeling. If I decide that I'm not going to take a particular action because it just costs too much, and now am I feeling stressed about it? Do I have anxiety about it? Do I worry about it? Or even guilty. If there's a cost involved in doing something with your family and you say, I, I can't, it, it's just going to cost too much. Boy, there's a lot of pack guilt into that for sure. You know, you can even think about risk to your health or this is so much effort to have it be like this. That is a cost as well. Maybe there are costs to your reputation if this is something that's going to be embarrassing or even moral costs if this is something that goes against our basic morality, when a company asks an employee to do something immoral, wow, we just have to get this customer to sign the bill because we need this contract sold, right? Something like that. But the moral impact that you will have on your employees, the guilt that you will cause them, the risk to their feeling like they want to be employed in a company like that, right? More costs or even legal consequences of that cost. I even remember I did a project where we were trying to find a way to get people to be able to securely log into a system. And interestingly enough, the system wasn't production. It was just a test system. So this was more about protecting knowledge, protecting our software. My boss wanted me to come up with two-factor authentication. This was before it could be done on cell phones. So you had to have a fob, which means I was going to have to send this fob out to thousands of people. I looked at the cost and it wasn't so bad because I didn't have so many people accessing the system right now. But then I did a 10-year analysis and I estimated the price of me putting a fob in an envelope 
ordering them, first of all, then putting in an envelope, sending it out, putting stamp on it, and then having them hoping they return it to me after 3.5 years, the price of this project ballooned out of control. And so I think I impressed my boss when I showed him that I wasn't just looking at what it was going to cost now. What is it going to cost in the future? So understanding the costs so that you get a good grip on what everything is that's going to cost you, then being able to evaluate what is the real cost and looking at them all and determining which ones matter to a company that asks its employees to do something unethical. That type of cost can have such a long range bad choice that even if it feels good to get that contract signed right now, the damage that it will do to this company years down the road might be company ending, right? Or if you think about a project that you're trying to do, I don't know, maybe to move your family away so that you can take on this better job in this other place, but you know secretly that you can work in this company locally for only a couple of years, but after a few years, they're going to make you want to move to wherever this job is, right? You're going out and talking to your family and saying, oh, we get to still stay here. I get to take this job. And then in two, three years, when the company says, okay, great, now you have to come and work at the headquarters, you have uprooted your family, you lied to your family, you know, that kind of thing. So you want to make sure you set all the costs at the right level that matter the most. And that you have to also understand that you're not going to be able to pick everything all at the same time. So then comes the question is, how can we then remove cost from this? Are there ways that we can reduce the cost? Just because something costs a certain thing right now or costs in a certain way, maybe that cost can be changed. Think about that reputational cost with your family. You knew taking this job that you were going to have to move to the other side of the country to take the job. You just didn't want to share that with them. Maybe you do share that with them and say, this is an opportunity for us to live here. Look, I researched the town. Can you reduce that? cost and mitigate the situation so that it doesn't cost as much. In my particular case with my roof, I found a way, because I needed a new chimney too, that also got destroyed in the hail, to do something else that ended up saving me about $6,000. So there are ways to mitigate, reduce the cost, and that way you can make a better decision. This company I picked was the only company that offered me this opportunity to save the $6,000 without impacting the quality of the job, without impacting anything, except for a little bit of aesthetic appeal. And if I'm rolling in money, you know, 10 years from now, I could go ahead and go back and change that decision. So I was able to mitigate a cost. But these costs are important. It talks to us about why we don't change, why we don't take a leap sometimes in making our own lives better, you know, taking a new job, getting married, looking for a spouse, you know, all these things. We, we just evaluate this cost. So can we manage them better? Can we analyze them better? And then can we mitigate the cost? Those are basically how we can deal with those costs so that we understand them in our own lives and, and, and deal with them a little bit better. Now let's talk about incentives. And this is one way of sometimes mitigating a cost for somebody. It's about how can we make a decision more appealing? How can we make something feel better than what it is? And I think that this can be manipulative, and I'm not talking about this in a manipulative way at all. This is a quote, Antoine de saint Exupery, who wrote the Little Prince book. He says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood, don't assign them to tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. It's important to get people on board. People hate change. They don't want to do it. There's another quote from Grace Hopper who says, humans are allergic to change. They love to say, we've always done it this way. I try to fight that. That's why I have a clock on my wall that runs counterclockwise. Forget about leadership. She felt that the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it this way. This is how we're always going to get stuck. This is not just true in business. This is not just true in the work world. This is true with our personal lives, too, that we get stuck in ways. And we each have different, I don't know, levels of risk that we're willing to take in our own lives. But sometimes when we can look at incentives, we can change. We can make a change that makes our lives better. 
even in my own know, deciding on going and getting a new job, I was never really going to leave my company. I never was. It wasn't the thing I was ever going to do. But how I started thinking about it differently was looking at the new opportunities, the new incentives, the new ways that this was going to make my life better. And instead of getting stuck and instead of getting trapped into these old ways, I had this opportunity now to look at how this could change my life for the better. And that's partially what incentives are. It's, again, a little bit different when you're doing incentives to other people compared to how you're doing them to yourself. Think about a kid who won't go to school or won't work hard in school. Are there incentives, and we've seen so many of them, work basically money for good grades? Or we'll go to Disneyland if you get all Bs this year. Now, again, you have to start with small steps. You have to entice that person in such a way that it doesn't feel manipulative. People hate that. They don't want to be manipulated. And of course, when you offer incentives, that's the whole point, right? You're trying to get people to do something that you want them to do, but people don't want to feel like pawns. So there are ways that you can get people to work harder. There are ways that you can get children to do their chores or work harder in school. We've all seen chore charts so that kids get a reward when they do a certain exercise within home. We've even tried them on ourselves, right? If I do this all the time, if I lose X amount of pounds or if I do this thing, I told myself that if I can get this one project I was doing in my home life done by December 1st at Christmas time during the Christmas sales, I was allowed to buy myself an X, trying to incentivize myself to doing what it is I wanted to do. Incentives can be powerful. It makes employees work better. Have you ever seen where there's bonuses given when we have these three goals? And if these three goals are met, there's going to be an additional bonus. My last company on the performance review, we all had to have one goal that was agreed upon between the employee and the boss. And if you accomplish that goal, there was going to be an additional bonus at bonus time for you. So a way to get people to do the things that you want them to do. We have to be careful about that structure, but it can be very powerful. I was a supervisor at a company that gave an incentive to an extent to employees, this was tech support, who had an average six-minute call time across all their calls. They thought that this was going, we're going to fix people's questions up quickly. You'll be able to get back on the phone and do more questions. This will make all customers happy. You know what happened? People's problems didn't get solved. Oh, we'll try rebooting the system. And when it comes back up, just give us a call again. I'm going to dump you off so I can have a quick call time or even worse. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you on the other line. I'm really sorry. Please try calling back again. Now to make up for the 10 minute call they had just a moment ago where they actually made the customer happy. I just hung up on you. So I had a three second call to get me my average directly. That is not what any of the companies or the customers or the employees wanted at all. But that was the incentive. This is a main known brand company. And to this day, I won't accept, purchase, sign up for any of their products because now I know what kind of people they are that causes this kind of support, this awful level where everyone feels terrible to happen. And sometimes the incentive itself is built into the proposition. So I gave this example of a person who was going to get offered a job. And after a couple of years, they were going to have to move out to work at the headquarters of this company, but they could stay in their home at least for a couple of years. Maybe their kids were just going to finish grade school or high school or something like that. You negotiated as part of your job, but secretly in your head, you know, after two, three years, you're going to have to move out there. You don't tell your family because you really want to take the job. And now you have reputational costs. So you decide, I have to go to my family, I have to be honest with them and tell them that we're going to have to move in three years to this job. When you're explaining the situation, some of the incentives themselves are built into this whole idea. We're going to live someplace new. This place is right by Yosemite. This place, we're going to be able to get a bigger house. We've complained that this house is too small. We will get a bigger house because we will be making more money. We'll be able to afford a bigger house. Because this job is changing things, 
we'll have an opportunity to see all new things that we've never seen before. And with the internet and Zoom, my incentive to you is I will pay for a Zoom account so you can hang out with your friends here in this town we're in now for as long as you want. There are ways to build incentives in to get the goal you want to do, or like I said, to get yourself to do the things you want to do. So there are three basic kinds of incentives, money or prize incentives that will try to motivate you, social incentives, that's praise, recognition, uh, an award at the company, something where this person is recognized for the thing they did. Then there's intrinsic incentives, and that's giving people satisfaction, purpose, or even, you know, think about weight loss. If you lose 100 pounds, I'm going to let you take a trip to, I'm telling myself this, to Portugal and go hiking in Portugal. That is a monetary incentive because I'm going to go someplace. But it's also a reward in having an adventure because now, because I did the hard work and I lost the weight, I can have something I couldn't do before. So it works as a different kind of incentive. We see them all, all the time in the lives around us. Team celebration, company awards, being sent to a conference so that you can network with your peers and find out more information. There might be financial incentives, you know, that companies do. You even see it all the time, right? Move to our bank and we will give you an extra hundred dollars. Come sign up for our insider club and we'll give you 5% back every purchase you make. Incentives are always out there. And like I said, people do them because they work. So how do we make our own incentives? Is first of all, you want to make sure whether it's for you, your family, the people around you, your company, that it is clearly laid out what behaviors are wanted, what the achievement is, what the rewards will be when they get that, and everything has to be crystal clear. You also have to take a step back and make sure that when you're creating these structures, it's actually what you want to have. Because there is something that is called the effect of unintended consequences. There was a story about a company that was a factory and it gave out incentives for employees who made the most number of widgets on this factory floor. So people started turning them out left and right. They started turning out garbage. The, the widgets were poorly made. They weren't put together correctly. And the company lost its customers because this was now garbage. They put the wrong incentive structure in place, right? And, that, and we have to make sure we don't create that kind of situation. We have to come up with some place where it'll be public where there's a, a massive goal. I remember my gym had that if you could stair climb up Mount Everest over the course of this summer, which was many, many feet, but there was a gigantic mountain poster and it had a flag for every person in that gym and how far up they climbed. It's pretty exciting. I even did a rowing thing with the Concept 2 rowers where they handed out a map and you were supposed to row to all these islands. And when you turned in your card, and you checked off these boxes, they sent you a t-shirt. You want to make sure that this is really visible. Everyone can see their progress. You want to make sure that you monitor the situation. Again, if you create widgets and you're finding that your program is causing bad widgets, causing people to do what you ask them to do, but it's causing something else bad to happen. There was a company I worked with, and they ended up having an incentive because so few people showed up very early in the morning. So they offered an incentive for people who would show up early. And you're going to see where this is going. People did it to get the incentive and then they left early and now there was no one to cover the evening. So you have to be really careful. And as soon as you see now what's happening, you can adjust your project a little bit or maybe end the project, say, okay, now this incentive program's over. We got a new incentive program because this one wasn't working the way we hoped it was. Whether you're doing this for yourself or you're doing this with your family, you want to make sure that whenever there's success, pat people on the back, pat yourself on the back. You have something that's public that you can celebrate this. Even if you had the goal that I want to lose 100 pounds in two years, you want to maybe tell your friends. They'll help you keep accountable. But then when you get there, your friends are going to cheer you on. So having that kind of public success will make it better. 
the nice thing about having a very good incentive plan, whether it's at work or at home, is people will not feel that you're favoring one family member over another. So think about the fact that you're a parent and you have three kids and you want your kids to do their chores. So you come up with a incentive measure so that if they do these chores this reliably, they'll get a financial reward for doing that. This way it's nice because a good structured incentive program will make every kid feel like you're not favoring one child over another. Well, why did, why did you give this child $10 to go to the movies, but you won't give me $10 to go to the movies? So it's a very good program. But again, you want to create it in such a way that it'll just lead to the proper um, behaviors, the proper actions that you want to take. So I hope that helps in understanding costs versus incentives and how we can analyze the situation and maybe come up with some intriguing solutions to the problems we have. My challenge to you is come up with one problem you're having right now. Do a deep dive assessment of all the costs involved in acting and not taking the action, or maybe even having a third action. Then see if you can't come up with some sort of an incentive structure that will help you get whatever goal it is you're seeking. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always subscribe, tell a friend, and share this podcast with other people. Remember that this podcast is now on Tuesdays and it's every other week. This gives us all time to kind of soak in the advice and try to do some of the actions and tasks together. And just remember our walk with figuring out problems, assessing their costs, and then figuring out incentives to help us get through our goals starts with small steps.